Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I am with Inspire Ministries and I am so glad that you have landed on today's video. In recent weeks, I have had a couple people reach out to me that they would be interested in me doing a video concerning marriage and more specifically about how they would pray maybe for an unbelieving spouse or maybe how they can be encouraged in their marriage. And really, it is one of my heart's cries in speaking about marriage, specifically to young married women. But of course, this can be something that women who have been married for a very long time can take Take away something from. I want to start today with just coming to you with a raw, unfiltered chat where I would just sit down with you and kind of talk about what marriage should look like according to the Bible. And I'm hoping to make this a mini series where I would come to you every week or maybe every other week with just some encouragement because I know that it's hard. I know marriage isn't always easy, and I know from experience I've been married for 26 years, I know from experience that it can be very challenging and can be very difficult to maintain our godly womanhood in the midst of maybe some difficulties that we've had in our marriage. And so I want to just share today with you some of my initial thoughts. I want to share my own personal story with you. I want to share some things that you can begin to speak to your husband about or the way that you can begin to speak to your husband, some of the things that you can begin saying more specifically. And then I want to talk about what does scripture say? And this is the most important part. What does scripture say? How does scripture explain to us how we are to live as godly women of faith, even if we are married to an unbelieving spouse? And so if this is a video that you think that you would be interested in getting more information about, let's just hop in into the video. I want to start first by sharing my story because I think it's really important that you understand who I am, where I come from, and what my experience has been. I met my husband back, I would say, in the year 1994. Yes, I'm showing my age here, but we met in 1994. We had a mutual friend who tried setting us up on kind of a blind date. She had invited me over to her house and she had invited him over to her house. House, and conveniently, we were to, you know, conversate and that we would get along and we would really, you know, fall head over heels in love with each other. And that was her initial plan. And can I say that that initial plan failed. She had been friends with my husband for many years. She was born and raised in the very same town that he was, and so she knew him very well. Their families were very well acquainted with one another and very good friends, and so she thought very highly of him, and she had known me for a very significantly lesser time, but she also found that she respected me and loved me and longed to get me connected to somebody that she loved and admired, and it didn't go as planned. In fact, I would initially say that I thought that he was cocky and arrogant, and he would initially say about me things that, well, I'm not even going to go there. He specifically said that he noticed right away that I had dirty shoes, and it was such a turnoff for him. But can I just defend myself for a minute? At that time, I worked as a nanny, and so my job was to take care of these children all day long, and they happened to live on the beach on a lake nearby. And so we were in the water, in the beach, uh, you know, in the sand all day long. And so of course I was going to have dirty shoes, but for whatever reason, that's the one thing that stood out in his mind. Now flash forward the year later, I would see him again and he would knock on my window as I was waiting for my boyfriend at the time, someone else that I was dating at the time, to come back in to the car after I dropped him off at a convenience store and Trevor would knock on my window and ask me if I remembered being introduced to him a year before and I thought no I really didn't because he didn't leave that big of an impression on me and so we would have this conversation where later on in that evening he would ask me in front of the guy I was dating if he could have my number so that
that he could call me later. And of course I told him no, but of course I was curious because who on earth would have that much audacity to do that? And so he would send me flowers for the next couple weeks, almost every single day, and pursued me. And uh, here we are, 25, almost 26 years later, we have been married since 1997. Now we got married in 1997 and I have to say that I was a completely different person then than I am now. And praise the Lord for that. When we first got married, I was a very jealous person. And I had trust issues very, very, very badly. Every time he left the house, I would think that he was going to cheat on me with somebody else. I mean, truth be told, that's just what I thought. I had significant trust issues, and so it played a significant role in our relationship. It really had, uh, you know, wreaked some havoc on our relationship when we first got married. And so for years, for the, I'd say maybe at least the first maybe year, year to four or five years, I dealt with that issue. And it was an issue that I carried into our marriage and an issue that we struggled with for a very long time. But the more that I fell in love with Jesus, the more that I got more into my faith and I got closer to the Lord, I began to see myself change in this area. And so, Praise the Lord that he saved me. Praise the Lord that he rescued me. Praise the Lord that he was so good and he was so kind and he was so patient with me in that time because the Lord really worked in our marriage in those first few years. Now, I remember when my daughter was born, she was born in the year 2000. We'd only been married a little over three years at that time. And um, I decided, or we decided, Decided that we would really like to go to church. I'd been a Christian almost all my life. He had claimed that he was a Christian because he believed in God up to that point, but he was not a born-again Christian. And we just believed that it was time that we would get together and figure out where we were going to go to church. And he said something interesting that I bet is probably the case for not just our family, but many families out there. He would say to me, well, you know what? I'm not interested in church shopping, so why don't you go find a church that you like, visit there a few Sundays, let me know how you like it, and if you like it, I will come visit. And so I did that. I went to this church that my sister-in-law was going to at the time, and I liked it. And I can't say that I believed in everything that they were teaching, or that I was completely sold out to their theology, or their values as a church, but I desperately wanted to belong somewhere. I desperately knew that it was something that I needed to do for our family. And so I started going and I went the first few weeks and I, I decided that it was something that I really liked. It was somewhere that I thought that we could be as a family. And so I invited my husband to come and I happened to invite him to come on a Sunday night. And I'll never forget that it was the wrong Sunday night to invite him to this church because it was a healing ceremony that was going on that night. And I'm not saying anything is wrong with that at all, but it was far past asked what he was comfortable with. And he was very, very uncomfortable that night. He hated everything about it and said that he would absolutely never come back. But the truth was, at that point, I had signed up for ministry work to work with the youth on Thursday nights. I had already um, said that I would work in the nursery uh, every other Sunday. And so I felt like at that time I was committed to that church. And so I said, well, I don't know what you're gonna do on Sundays and Wednesdays and Thursdays then, but I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna do this because we thought that it was gonna be something that was gonna be important for our family to do. I am sold out to doing this. I'm committed to doing this with or without you. Now, I did this for about six months, seven months, maybe 10 months at tops before I began to really be weary in my spirit because I would see all of these other families coming to church as a family unit, right? The husband, the wife, the children. And I was coming alone every single Sunday with my then like two, three, four month old baby. And I remember having a conversation with a pastor one day and I said, I'm having such anxiety and I'm feeling so bad and so disheartened because my husband will not come to church. 
And I remember what that pastor said to me. He pulled me aside into his office and he said, Wendy, do not stop praying for your husband. Keep praying that the Lord would radically touch his heart. Keep being faithful. As long as you keep being faithful and you keep demonstrating Jesus in your own life, then soon enough he will come along. He will see the Jesus in you and pretty soon he will want that for himself. And I remember being so captivated by those words that I went right home and immediately began to pray for my spouse. And again, it wasn't that he was a bad guy. It wasn't that he was abusive or neglectful, none of those things. I just wasn't 100% sure that at the end of the day, if he were to die, that he would go to heaven. You know what I mean? I really struggled because we'd never had that conversation. He knew that I was a believer. He knew that I was a Christ follower. I had told him my story from when I was a child and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at a Baptist church camp when I was 11 years old. So I had already shared that experience with him. So he knew that for me, but I didn't know that to be 100% true for him. And so I just began this journey of praying for him every single day, praying that God would captivate his heart, praying that God would radically touch him in a powerful way, praying that he would meet Jesus for himself. Because what I knew to be true is that I could have my own faith. I could be faithful in everything that I did, but I couldn't be faithful for him. Only he could be faithful for himself. Only he could meet Jesus experience Jesus and love Jesus and choose to follow Jesus for himself. So flash forward a few years later, I stopped going to that church, I think probably because I got a little bit frustrated with their theology. I didn't line up with everything that they were teaching. And so the Lord moved me away from that church. Flash forward to the year about 2004. My daughter was just turning four that year. And again, we kind of revisited this whole idea of we need to have a church. We need to be going to a church. And so I happened to be with my mother-in-law and my husband and my daughter that day when I opened up an article in the newspaper. And there was this big black and white advertisement in the back of this particular newspaper, our, our city's newspaper at the time, that said, you've never done church like this before. And I remember thinking, wow, I mean, this is radical. This is different. I wonder what they mean by this. The whole entire article was black and it had this really powerful logo and uh, an, an invitation to their Easter Sunday services that particular year in 2004. And so I remember saying something to my mother-in-law who wasn't going to church at the time either. And I said, I would love to go to this church. If we were to go to this church tomorrow, do you want to come with us? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. That looks cool. And so my husband agreed and we all went to church that next day and it started us on a journey of going every single week. Now that particular church became the place that I would serve on staff at for seven and a half years. And I loved that church. I loved our family. I loved our church. I loved our pastor. I loved our staff. And I particularly loved the fact that my husband met Jesus at that church. I'll never forget. It was a Sunday morning. They were doing a recommit service. So anyone who was married, this was a service about marriage, anyone who was married, the pastor asked them to stand up if they wanted to renew their marriage vows, if they wanted to renew their marriage covenant. And of course, we immediately leapt off of our seats and we were to face each other holding hands. And I remember in that moment, I looked at my husband, we were supposed to be praying, and I looked over at my husband because I could feel him kind of shaking. And I looked over at him and with tears streaming down his eyes, he looked at mine and he said, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Now, you can imagine my surprise at this time. I was like, what are you sorry for? I really anticipated that he was going to tell me something awful, that maybe he was going to confess some sin or tell me that he had been unfaithful. I was scared to know what he was sorry for. And all of a sudden, all I found myself saying was, it's okay. It's okay. Whatever it is, it's okay. And he said, no, you don't understand. And he proceeded to explain to me that he was sorry for the fact that he never got it up until that point. He never understood what being a Christian, what being a Christ follower meant. 
he never really understood. And he said, I'm sorry for putting you in a position where you had to worry about whether or not I would go to heaven if I died. And I can say with 100% certainty that today is a new day for me. And it was in that moment that he gave his life to Christ. And friends, I'm here to tell you today that it was the most profound and the most holy moment that I've probably ever experienced in my marriage. And I remembered all of those years of praying for him at that point. I remembered all of those years where I had begged God to touch my husband in a way that only he could. And he did it. He answered that prayer. But can I also tell you something else? That right then and there, I remember feeling like my work was really cut out for me because I really felt the weight of the world in that moment because I had been the one who had been a Christian all of my life. And I knew at that moment that my husband would be looking to me for an example to live by. I knew that he was going to be looking at my life and he was going to be looking for ways that I, my life emulated Christ, right? And so I knew that I had a large responsibility as a godly wife. And I want to read to you today some scriptures that were very, very helpful for me in those early years, but they've also been even more helpful for me as a more mature follower of Jesus Christ and a more mature woman who has been married for 25 years, right? So I want to take you today to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want to read the first several verses to you out of the New Living Translation, which is my primary Bible, and then I want to read it to you because I think it's so profound, out of the Amplified Classic version. And then I want to talk to you practically about some of the ways that I believe that we can break down these scriptures and interpret what is being said here and then apply it to our life. And again, this, I'm hoping, will be an ongoing series. So I'm not going to give you everything today, but I want to give you some things that can encourage you in your faith. So 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading out of verse 1, and I think I'm going to go all the way to verse 7. This is Paul speaking, and he's talking, or I'm sorry, this isn't Paul speaking. This is Peter speaking. I'm so used to the apostle Paul and talking about him all the time. This is Peter talking, and Peter says this, In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husband. Now, I want to back up for a minute and say that anytime you start a chapter with in the same way, you have to look back and what was being talked about before. And right before that, he was talking about Jesus. And he was talking about how he never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. He never threatened revenge when he was suffered. And he left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. And of course, he's talking specifically and reiterating the same prophecy that we find in Isaiah 52 um, and 53. So now we see that he is coming to, after describing Jesus, he is then saying, in this same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husband. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be soon won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty or fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. Verse 5. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, it says in verse 6, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, now again, we're starting another, another section of scripture where it says, in the same way, Your husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wives with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. 
Now let's just talk through this for a little minute because I know that there are going to be some who push back on this subject. I know there are many of us who would say, I don't want to live subject to my husband. I don't want to be under his authority or heaven forbid me feel like I have to obey him. But I want to show you something, especially in this series, because it's exactly what God's word says. It says that wives must accept the authority of our husbands. Why? Because our husbands are ultimately the head of the household. It is how God created the union between man and wife. It's how he created the dichotomy of how the household is to be run. The man is the head of the household. He is ultimately responsible to God for his family. So that means at the end of the day, he has to answer to how he served his family, how he led his family, how he taught and instructed his family. He's responsible to God for that. And because of that, we need to live under the authority of that umbrella of leadership that God has ordained. It's very, very important. We are subject to our husbands because our husbands are subject to to God. Does that make sense? And so that is the order that we see that Peter describes here in this particular book. He says, then even if some refuse to obey the good news, so that means even if you are living with a spouse who doesn't believe the word of God to be true, doesn't even live by scripture, doesn't believe and refuses to obey what the good news says, the Bible, then we will still be living godly lives and our godly living will speak to them without any words. I love this. And so I've got to think that that was true for me, that the Lord was so good and he was so kind and he was so faithful and so patient with me to, to give me the, the, um, the wherewithal, to give me the mind, to give me the heart to want to live a godly life so that even when my husband wasn't living for the Lord, even when he wasn't serving him, even when he didn't believe in the totality of scripture, even when he wasn't living under the divine authority of God, he was still impacted and influenced by my life as a godly woman. Listen, I would encourage you today, if you are living with a spouse who is suffering in his faith, he is maybe experiencing a setback in his faith, or maybe he doesn't have any amount of faith at all, and he doesn't believe in this God that you know and love and talk about all the time, keep being faithful yourself. And do it not because, maybe not because you can yet fully honor him in his position in your family, but do it because you honor God and his position of divinity in your life. Live with the fear and the reverence of the Lord. Live as unto God. Keep living godly. Keep trusting God. Keep being faithful. Keep praying. Keep praising. Keep worshiping. Keep attending a body of believers. Keep doing these things. And by your husband seeing your godly living, it will impact him. It will influence him. And by your petitioning to God on his behalf, things will change. Let's go on. He says, by your godly lives, your godly lives will speak without any words at all. They will, meaning your husband, they will be won over by observing your pure and your reverent lives. Your pure and your reverent lives. The word pure here means holy. It means blameless. It means clean. It means innocent. It means modest. It means perfect. That is what this word pure means here. These are the ways that we behave in our life that demonstrate the God of the universe that we serve. Because listen, if we are bogging our husband down with complaining, 
and being judgmental and being argumentative, are we demonstrating Jesus? We are, in fact, giving him a false idea, a false picture of Jesus. And we cannot do that. The price that we pay for that is too costly. And so we have to live pure lives. We have to live blameless lives. I I read somewhere once where someone said, live in such a way that if anybody were to talk bad about you, nobody would believe it. And so apply that to your marriage. Live in a way, in your home, live in a way that is pure, that is blameless, that is holy, that lives unto the Lord, praising Him and honoring Him in everything that you do and everything that you say in your home, around the people who know and love you the most, so that if someone outside of your home were to say, Wendy isn't all she's cracked up to be, she's not a very good person, she's not kind, she's not moral, she's not faithful, she's not good, live in such a way that if they were to say that, that the inside people, the ones who know you the best, would say, you must not know the same person that I know because she's pure, because she's blameless, because she's holy, because she's perfect. And pretty soon, you see, he is describing the bride of Christ. He is describing someone who only can live that way because they are living under the jurisdiction of heaven. They can only do that. They can only live this way because we are living under the authority of Jesus Christ. And pretty soon he is defining the very characteristics of Christ because he sees those characteristics in his bride. And he says, It says this, they will be won over by observing your pure and your reverent lives. Reverency here is respect. It is awe and it's fear of God. It is demonstrating to our husbands that we are not, we're not compromising on who we are allowing to be the authority figure in our life. And we are living in subjection to not only him, but to God. We have an awe and a reverence for God. You know, I believe that one of the things that we as believers have a tendency to do is live far below the, the, the level of reverency that we need to have for God. And I also believe that we live far below the respect level that we need to have for our husbands. And that is respect even when they're not living the way that they need to live. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you three things at the end of this that you do not want to miss that I believe are three things that we can begin saying to our husbands and, that, to our husbands and, and, and things that we can begin to incorporate in our lives that I believe that will significantly change the trajectory of our marriage. So let's go on. Don't be concerned, he says, about the outward beauty or fancy hairstyles or expensive jewelry or beautiful clothes. Now, does that mean that you can't look good or that you can't do your hair or you can't curl it or you can't put makeup on or put jewelry on? Absolutely not. It says, don't be concerned about these things. Don't be concerned. Don't allow your mind to be so consumed with those things. Because listen, when we go out, we don't have anybody to impress. We are to impress our husbands. The other day I was on TikTok and I was watching this girl who has a TikTok channel specifically devoted to making meals for her husband. Her husband works uh, an outside job outside of the house. It seems to be maybe a factory job where he works a ton of hours, like 12 to 14 hour days. And she will make his lunch and make his dinner and she will pack it, freshly pack it, uh, freshly make the food and pack it and then take it to her husband. And what she said was one day that she, she had a dress on and she said one day in her video that she often wore a dress because she so wanted to look good for her husband. She wanted to be, um, be presentable to him. She wanted to be be uh, someone that he would look at with admiration. And can I tell you the amount of heck she caught for that? She got all kinds of negative responses from people who are like, girl, I can't believe that you submit to your husband like that. I can't believe that you would you would stoop so low to, to think that you had to live like in the 50s. Like, who are you? And I have to say that I was so impressed with her. She was probably all of like 23, 24 years old, but she saw the 
significance in being a presentable offering to her husband. She saw it as a way that she could serve him by looking pretty, by presenting herself in the best light, and actually by shining her inward light, she was more demonstrating Christ in that moment than, than ever. And so I love this, but it says, don't be so consumed or so concerned with those things. You should clothe yourself instead with beauty that comes from within. So it's an inward beauty, right? The unfading beauty beauty, he said, of a gentle and a quiet, a gentle and a quiet spirit. How often do you see women who have a quiet and a gentle spirit? How often do we see that displayed? Not often. You know why? I think because we live with this competing mindset. We almost feel as though we have to compete with our husband. And can I say that that is the most dangerous thing that we could do, not only for our relationship, but it's the most dangerous thing we could do for our spiritual growth because it is not the order that God intended. He intended for women to live quiet, peaceful lives. Let me give you this wonderful illustration. One of my best and dearest friends is a woman who is not on social media platforms. Years ago, she felt like God was telling her to get off of social media. And so she just did. She got off of Facebook. She got off of Instagram. She got off of watching YouTube. She just got off all of it because she really felt like she was being obedient to God in doing so. And it's been years since she's been back on social media. And she will tell me oftentimes when we talk, she will say, Wendy, it's a, it's sometimes it's a very lonely life. She's married to a farmer who, especially during um, planting and harvest season, he is in the fields all day and all night. And so sometimes she doesn't see him from five o'clock in the morning all the way until 10 o'clock at night, only for the times that he might pop in to have lunch and dinner. And she said, it can be very, very lonely. It can be. But she said, do you know that it is the holiest moments when I am here on the farm and it's just me and I don't have any outside noise. I have nothing to compete with on the outside. I just am quiet before the Lord. I'm still before him and I read his word. Sometimes that is the most holy moments that she's experienced. And can I tell you that there's a part of me that is envious of that sometimes? I believe that as women, we were designed to live quiet, peaceable lives, honoring our spouses and serving the Lord faithfully. And I think about that friend a lot, and it almost brings tears to my eyes as I think about her faithfully being that God-centered, God-fearing wife who sits at her table every day, prays for her meals, prays for her husband, prays for her kids, and trusts the Lord. There's no competing. There's nothing in her that wants to have this large platform. There's nothing in her that wants to compete with the platform that her husband has. She just wants to live a quiet and peaceable life, and I love that. And so this is what he is saying. He is saying that this is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God. They accepted the authority of their husbands. I love that. And that is what we are called to do. Let me read it to you out of the Amplified Classic Version because I love it. It goes into more detail with what these words mean. And I'm going to read it to you, um, maybe only a few verses. But the first couple verses I want to read to you say this. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands. Subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them. Wow. Think about that. You are being secondary to them, but also dependent on them. I don't know about you, but I'm dependent on my husband. When things go wrong, when, when things malfunction in our home, when there is something that is scary happening in our home. A few weeks ago, I had some loud noises and I was desperate for my husband to come home so that I could not have to be alone with these loud noises that I had no idea where they were coming from, right? I am living uh, subordinate to him, I'm living secondary to him, but I'm living dependent on him, which means he has authority over me. He has to answer to me. He has to take care of me. And then it says to adapt yourselves to him, to, to, to adapt ourselves to him, to find out what is it that I can do to serve him more, 
to love him more, to sow more peace into the family, right? Goes on to say, so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over, not by discussion, in other words, not by words, but by godly lives of their wives. Boy, that could be a series all in and of itself. Godly lives of the wives, right? Verse 2. Now listen to this one, verse 2. It says, When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves, together with your reverence for your husband, that is, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect, defer to, refer him, or revere him, Revere means to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, adore him. And adore means to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Have you ever thought about the ways that you are to revere him, to defer to him, to honor him, to esteem him? to appreciate him, to prize him, to enjoy him? When is the last time that you complimented your husband? Two weeks ago, true story, and my husband's probably watching this video, so he is my backup that this is true story. A couple weeks ago, I felt very compelled to honor my husband with my words. Again, we're talking about honor with our lives, but I remember a couple weeks ago, I was listening to my husband on the phone. It was late into the night. He was working late hours. It was almost seven o'clock. He was talking to someone that he works with on the phone and he was being so kind and so respectful and he was being so good to this person. You could tell that the other person on the phone was heated. Maybe they were upset about something, but he was being so good in that moment. When he got off the phone, I said to him, you know what, Trevor, you are such a good worker. You do such an amazing job. I can't imagine that anyone would ever be angry after that discussion, after that kind of conversation that you just had with that individual. I can't imagine that anybody would not appreciate you being so good to them. And so I remember in that moment, it was like, I don't know what it did to him, but I know what it did to me. And I know that our husbands do not hear it enough from us. They don't hear it from us enough that they are good. They don't hear it from us enough that they are special and that they are kind and that they are honorable and that they, you know, that they are, are, are filled with, with, um, with goodness and, and we, we, we just don't say it enough to them. We just don't compliment them enough, right? And, and so I, I just think that I want to share just a couple thoughts about our submitting to our husbands because I think the world would change. I, I know drastically our homes would change. And if our homes change, then we are unstoppable with what we can change in the world. I believe that our main desire when submitting to our husbands needs to be two things. When submitting to our husbands, it should be to, to do well in order to do well, right? To serve God, to do well, to just love our husbands well, to be, as scripture says, the helpmate to our spouse. But I also think, number two, it's to ultimately please the Lord. And I think that when we say kind words, when we forgive easy, when we offer our reverency, when we offer our respect, even if it's not earned, then we're not only doing well, but we are submitting to God's authority and we're pleasing the Father. I, I, just, I just see him smiling. I, I just do. I just, I see him smiling. And so I, I want to say to you, especially younger wives, to, to live in such a way that you look to honor your spouse every day. Maybe it is just in something that you do for him. Maybe it's something in the, you, that you say to him, like I said to Trevor a couple weeks ago. Maybe you just honor him and you, you, you thank him for 
putting gas in your car or cleaning out the car or walking the dog or cleaning up dog poop or taking out the garbage. Maybe it's just something simple like that. Maybe it's something that you can begin really thinking about that we are so consumed with having a mind of Christ and so consumed with pleasing the Lord that we wouldn't ever want to do anything to dishonor our spouse. Can we live like that? I mean, can we really, really live like that? You know, I think about Jesus Christ when he came to this world, when he came to the earth to serve as a man, 100% God and 100% man at the same time. I think about him coming as a suffering servant. And maybe that's what he's calling you and I to be. Maybe he's saying that I came and I subdued you into believing me, into believing in me by suffering, by suffering for you. Maybe that's the same way that we're to be as Christ followers and as of wives. Maybe we are to win our spouse over, spouses over that same way by being suffering servants. I don't, I don't mean suffering at the hands of violence and neglect. I don't mean suffering at the hands of someone who is hurting you. Not at the hands of abuse. That's not what I mean. But what I mean is maybe we can learn to be godly wives who so fear the Lord in our husbands that we would never want to upset God's order and his divine plan for the family unit. I want to share with you three things, and I'm hoping to share three things every single time I make one of these videos. I'm, I'm hoping to share some things with you that you can begin to incorporate in your daily life. One of the things that I have began to, I've begun to, to see in my own life is that I have learned to say to my husband more and more throughout the years, this wasn't easy when we were first married, but I've learned to say I'm sorry. And not just I'm sorry for yelling or I'm sorry for, you know, hurting you or I'm sorry for disappointing you. Not, not, not just those big things, but the little things. You know, like, oh, I'm sorry I moved that and you had to go out of your way to put that back where it went. Or, oh, I'm sorry that I didn't pick that up when I moved right over it and I, I completely neglected that it was laying there. Or, oh, I'm sorry I didn't iron that shirt that I know you wanted to wear this weekend to that funeral that we have to go to. Like, simple things. Can we learn to say that I'm sorry? I think that this does something not just to us, but it does something to them, too. It shows that we are willing to be wrong. It shows that we are willing to not always have to be in competition with them. It shows that we are subordinate to them. It shows them their rightful place as the head of the house. And I think that there's power in it. Again, it doesn't just do something for me. It does. It releases me from, from just carrying the weight of maybe feeling ashamed of that thing that I did. But it also allows them to live in that place of authority for a moment and feel what it feels like to be the one who is responsible for the family without our even having to remind them of it. The second thing is pay attention to how you talk to them on the phone, especially when you are around other people. I, I thought about this years and years and years ago, not specifically about my marriage, but I thought about it as it related to my mom. Now, my mom used to call me every day at work when I worked um, in real estate many, many years ago. I was probably, you know, in my early 30s. And she used to call me all the time. And I remember that when she would call me, I'd be like, hey, mama, how you doing today? And I would also observe the way that moms, when they called other coworkers, they would say, yeah, what do you want? And it was such a difference in the way that I honored my mom and they didn't honor their mom. And I'm not saying that I am better than they are or that I had some great secret that they didn't have, but I'm just saying that I knew Jesus and I know what 
God says in his word about honoring your father and your mother. And so I would take that down even to your marriage, that when you talk to your spouse, especially if he's going to call you at work and he calls you and he's like, hey, you know, I, I wanted to let you know that I didn't, li- I didn't, you know, do this at home, right? You know, I didn't, I didn't lock that door. You're going to have to lock that door when you get home. And he's just kind of really just relaying basic information. I know the tendency would be when he calls to be like, yeah, what do you want? I'm really busy, right? Maybe what we can do instead when we talk to our spouse on the phone is we can go, hey, honey, how are you? I miss you. How you doing today? How was your day? Hey, babe, right? We can, we can be encouraging even with our words and how we respond to them calling us. That's huge. I think that's huge. And number three, that I believe that we could gain a lot from this, and that is asking our spouse, how can I make your life easier? What would be something that I can do to take the weight off of your shoulders this week? Is there something that I can alleviate for you this week that I can do for you to make your life easier? Listen, you might be a full-time mom too and your hours might be really limited in your day and you might be stressed out, you might be weary, but can you have the fear of God in your life? Can you revere God so much? Can you honor God's position as the head of this family? And can you honor and respect your husband's position so much that you would ask him, as his helpmate, how you can help him this week? I think it really matters. I have so much more to say about this subject, and I know this is already a long video, so I'm going to go ahead and end here. I look so forward to talking more about this because I have had so much fun today. These are tough things, and they are not easy. They are they're challenging at best. I know that, but can I tell you that I'm praying for you? Can I tell you that I, I've been where you are? I have felt the way that you feel. Trust me, I have, but I know that these scriptures and these principles, when we adhere these and when we adhere to these and when we live these out in our life, they help us 100%. Friend, if you have liked this video, would you give it a huge thumbs up? Would you subscribe to the channel? Would you hit that notification bell to be notified for every single time that I upload content just like this one? I already can tell you that I'm going to do another video about this next week because there's already so much more that I want to say on this subject. Thank you again for being with me today. Thank you for journeying with me through these episodes. I love doing these videos for you. And again, I am praying for you. I know that it's hard. I know that it's challenging, but you can do hard things. The Jesus that lives inside of you gives you more power than you can ever imagine. I love you, friend. I am praying for you. And until my next video, I pray that you have an awesome day with Jesus. Keep being faithful. I love you, friend. Bye-bye.